artificial intelligence. It is everywhere these days. In this episode, we're going to look at the one thing, the one thing about artificial intelligence that has to be understood by every Christian and really every human being for that matter. I'm Steve Smith. Welcome to this episode of the Going Deeper series of Interior Life, where we look at the spiritual realities that explain the fallen world around us. Let's begin with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Before we dive into this episode, I invite you to follow the link below to interiorlife.faith in our free guide of what it means to be human. And it goes through a very brief but powerful of all of our different faculties, our intellect, our will, our passions, our common sense, our five exterior and internal senses, and especially how all of these things are disordered and turned upside down and how we reorder them. Understanding this puts you ahead of 99% of the planet. And especially when we understand this, navigating the fallen world becomes so much easier, which is an interior life, what we desire for you. Okay, in this episode, we're gonna be looking at the very basics of artificial intelligence, just basic terms and so on, in case it's new to you, just to get us all on the same page, uh, even if, if you are familiar with it. We're gonna have a lot to say about artificial intelligence over time, because it isn't going anywhere. But we wanna look in this episode at the basics of artificial intelligence, the guts under the hood called neural networks, how do they work? Why is that important? Because that leads us then to the one thing, the one thing that all Christians, really all human beings have to have in mind, no matter what else you may think or know about artificial intelligence. What's that one key thing? That's where we'll end up. First, artificial intelligence. Let's just go through some general terminology. Well, have you used it yet? You probably have, but if not, we're going to focus on, you've probably heard of chat GPT. We're going to focus on that flavor of artificial intelligence because right now it's fairly representative, but everybody under the sun has their own version of it coming out. So if you, if you haven't yet, or you want to try that type of artificial intelligence, chat GPT was developed by OpenAI. You can go to OpenAI, O-P-E-N-A-I.com and just play around with it there. If you use the Bing search engine, Microsoft has incorporated GPT, the type of artificial intelligence programming developed by OpenAI that's been incorporated by Microsoft into their Bing search engine. So if you go into chat and if you talk away with that, you're interacting with GPT. Again, this, this one version of artificial intelligence. It's also, if you use Microsoft products, you're gonna more and more see their co-pilot. That's essentially GPT, which is the newer version of chat GPT. But any of those ways are opportunities to play around, tinker with artificial intelligence and get a sense of how it works. We'll also have some links in the discussion part of this in the comments down below where you can go to get more, more information of it that way of interacting with, with chat and get a sense for yourself of interacting with, with these types of artificial intelligence. Okay, first, just some basic terminology. Artificial intelligence, that's referring to computer programs that generally do things that are otherwise associated more with human reasoning. So instead of just basic calculations, you know, do my taxes, but well, there's nothing human in reasoning about taxes, but you have basic calculations. If we're getting to things that start dealing with reason and judgment, for instance, mapping software, that's basic artificial intelligence. Then there's generative artificial intelligence. This is AI that can generate creative content. So there's generative music AI. You can go to a, a program called Soundful or a service called Soundful that'll generate new music based on the, the genres and the particular interests that you put in there. Or in art, there's Dolly and Mid Journey. That's going to generate the famous one was putting in, I think, an image of Pope Francis and a word like fashionista or the like, and it'll generate images based on the prompts that you give it. Then there's chat artificial intelligence. That's where the real focus is these days, these chat bots like 
chat GPT. GPT just stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. That's a, a particular approach to programming and training artificial intelligence. That's GPT. Like most software, GPT has evolved through different versions of the software. The chat GPT, I think, was essentially GPT 3.5. These days, now it's mostly out there as GPT 4.0. That's why you don't see it called chat GPT anymore. It's generally just called GPT or GPT 4. And that is AI that's it meant it's called a large language model. The real focus there is on language, <laughs> figuring out what are proper responses to questions or prompts that are put to it so they can have an interaction and answer questions. And that brings us to, a, well, two other terms, LLM, large language model, so that it has a very broad vocabulary and understanding of language to work from so it can respond in a very seemingly natural way multimodal and gpt4 i, I think now has multimodal capabilities but this, so this is going to be ai that can not only recognize language but that can recognize images or sounds or so on so it can work in a number of different modes so just some basic terminology there i guess on the same page and then finally there's what's referred to as artificial general intelligence. And this is kind of the holy grail that you'll hear spoken of in, in hushed tones of artificial intelligence that is so advanced that it's it's basically human like or or even beyond human, whatever that might mean. The famous example is it came from the movie Blade Runner that you may have seen in that idea of artificial intelligence that seems so natural you wouldn't recognize that it was artificial just interacting with it. This is also the Turing test you might have heard from it. Artificial intelligence that passing the Turing test is that which you wouldn't realize after an extended conversation, say for an hour or longer, that you were not speaking with another human being. It would be that human-like. That is, for many, the desired endpoint of artificial general intelligence. Most people would agree that the AI platforms currently available are not human-like. They're not general intelligence, but you'll hear some people claiming it is or that it's getting very close. And that gets us to our focus here today of what is that main thing we need to keep in mind. Before we get there, we need to open the hood on the current approaches to AI and what's the real engine. How do they work? What's the programming architecture that they use? And that's called neural networks. There are a number of different approaches to artificial intelligence. Neural networks, far and away, are, are the leading approach and, and probably going to be for a long time. The idea is basically just to attempt to model our brains with our neurons. The human mind, we have billions and billions on the order of 100 billion individual neurons, and they're all interconnected. And that's what gives our brain this wonderful complexity, that ability to a degree of abstraction. As Christians, we know there's more to it than that, but for computer scientists, that's, that's what they're looking at. They think it's all just a matter of our physical brain. If we reproduce that, eventually we can essentially reproduce the human mind. We'll see about that. So neural networks, here you see in this image, there are three overall layers. You have the input layer. Then you have this big middle matrix of artificial neurons. This is, and keep this in mind, this is often called the hidden layer. This is where all the processing takes place. And then you get the output on the other end. Here's a simple example. Let's take baking a cake. Baking a cake, our inputs might be the ingredients for the cake. And let's say we, we have a computer, we can hook that computer up to our kitchen. We can get it literally bake the cake for us, okay? <laughs> right, it's the little computer arms and it's gonna put stuff in the oven and mix things up and, and whatnot. That input layer could be the ingredients of the cake, sugar and flour and shortening and whatnot. The output is gonna be the cake itself. What happens in the middle? In conventional com computer programs, what we'd have there would simply be the recipe. Okay, take those inputs and do this with them. This much sugar, this much flour, do this with the eggs, bake, them at, uh, bake it all at this temperature for this amount of time, out would come our cake. Okay, with artificial intelligence and neural networks, 
Now what happens is in that middle processing layer, the hidden layer, all of those individual, we'll call them nodes, each one you know, kind of stands for uh, a neuron in a human brain, but each of those nodes would represent some parameter of the cake, of those ingredients and what to do with them. You might have a sugar quantity node, how much sugar goes in. You might have an egg quantity node, how many eggs. You'd probably have an, an egg you know, type node. So is it just egg white or is it egg yolk? You'd have an egg preparation node. You need to whisk it first. You'd have nodes for the baking temperature, the baking time. Does the order of the ingredients matter? You'll have nodes that'll keep track of what needs to happen when. Imagine all this going in and then would come the output. So what happens when you start out, you just have this dumb computer program. It doesn't know how to bake a cake. You have all these nodes, but it doesn't really know what to do with them. And you give, say, just a, a, an initial starting value of one, just kind of equal importance to all of these different nodes. And you say, go ahead and bake the cake. And out comes the cake. And now here's the key. You start giving it feedback. So maybe this is the cake that comes out. And part of your feedback is, all right, let's have it not look quite so much like a cow pie. And so there's something in there that keeps track of what a cake should look like. And yeah, the shape node. And maybe the cake is a little bit too sweet, too. So you give it that feedback. So now the AI, it learns. So the sugar parameter node, it takes that down a little bit. All right, let's put a little less sugar on our cake. Let's make our cake look a little bit more like a cake. It should be this shape or whatnot. And it takes another shot at it. It bakes another cake. And then you taste that and okay, better, but it, maybe it's too dry now and a little too chocolatey. So now what does it do? Now it goes to the cocoa node and it, it takes that down a little bit and it goes to the shortening node and it increases that. So it'll be a little moister and it bakes another cake. And eventually you get to the point that, wow, that is a really good cake. That's just like grandma used to make. And you give it thumbs up okay you've now trained your neural network and that is the key neural networks you're going to hear time and again if you start paying attention they'll talk about how they're trained or tuned they'll talk about machine learning and deep learning whether the training is supervised or not so generally what's happening with the neural networks that are out there today so back to our cake example just think of how complicated that is thousands, thousands of little nodes and, and interconnections just for the cake. So for these large language models that can converse back and forth and understand what we're asking, it's billions. In fact, with GPT, that's on the order of our brain, on the order of 100 billion, reportedly, little individual nodes that are all getting interconnected. It gets trained partly by a small army of human users that are asking it questions and up and down voting the responses depending on how well they they answer the question how human like they are how easy they are to understand but that can only get just so far then they let the computer system self-train or train with limited supervision on a broader data, data set going through, uh, for instance, Wikipedia, going through a larger data set in on the internet and self-training given some basic rules it's given. This is when you get into what you'll hear called machine learning and deep learning. The key is that this neural network, it starts out a blank slate. It doesn't know what to do until you start feeding it data, asking it questions, giving it prompts, and then training it by upvoting or downvoting, tightening up the way it's responding to those prompts. Now we come to the key point, and we call this going deeper. In this case, we're actually gonna go very big picture on this for the big point, and then we're gonna drill into that in future episodes. The main point that has to be kept in mind is that AI is nothing but a dumb computer. It is just a dumb computer program. You can put it in a robot, and it'll just be a dumb computer program and a robot, nothing more than a sophisticated toaster. Now here's where it can be deceptive because it is complex and it can be hard for anyone to even predict exactly how AI will respond because it is so large and complex. And that's where you'll hear people already talking in hushed tones. We, we don't even really know how it's doing what it's doing. Well, it's not because it's suddenly becoming conscious. Remember 
keep this in mind. What is that middle processing layer called? The hidden layer. Think of all those billions and billions of interconnections. It's impossible to tease out what exactly is going on in there. It's not like if, we, going back to the cake example, if we had that prescriptive computer program that just says, put in this much sugar, put in this much flour, and we find that line in the computer program. And if it goes, if we're not getting the cake the way we want it, we just say, oh, I see, it's that line with the sugar. And it says, put in three tablespoons and it should be teaspoons, whatever. In the neural network, everything, it is hidden. You just have so many of these little interrelated neurons, nodes, and their values trying to tease out why any one response is being created from all these billions of interactions is nearly impossible. That doesn't mean the program is suddenly becoming conscious if it does something that the creators of it didn't expect. That's just called a bug because it's so complicated. Quick analogy, before we finish up, take a balloon. Let's say you take a balloon and you blow it up, but you don't tie it off, okay? And then you bring it outside, you point in a given direction, you let it go. Where does it end up? <laughs> when you let it go, it's gonna go all over the place and it could end up just about anywhere, including behind you. Would you suddenly think, wow, the balloon just became conscious? No, no, not at all. It's just really complicated. It, it didn't, I pointed it that way and it ended up over here. I could have never predicted that. No, you just say it's really complicated when you let a balloon go, because if you think of the, the neck and the lips of the balloon, the open end of it, the, the physics problem of, of how the air escapes from there, the turbulence of it, the overall shape of the balloon as it deflates, it's gonna act as an airfoil going through the air. It's gonna have a very irregular shape as it's deflating. It's almost impossible for anyone to simulate and predict where it's ultimately going to end up. So it is loose analogy with AI. It's just very complicated and it makes it harder and harder to predict its exact responses. And sometimes it can give surprising responses that people want to look at and say, wow, it's, it's so smart, it's conscious. No, it's just a dumb computer program that's responding the way it was programmed. It's just very difficult to then back out how exactly that hidden layer is working. So our takeaway for today, remember it's the hidden layer and it is not conscious, it's not human, it is not human-like, it, it cannot empathize, it does not have feelings, it does not have wisdom, it does not have judgment, it can't sacrifice for you, it should not be sacrificed for, it should not be given uh, the recognition of having human dignity. It is just a dumb computer program. You always have to have that before us because it, it is, it is deceptively complex and, and it will become more and more seductive for people as it becomes even more complex for them to think, wow, that that's human-like or even beyond human. We'll have many more episodes coming out where we're gonna dig deeper and see the very important ramifications of the fact that it is not human and it's very dangerous if we start thinking of it as being conscious or being human-like. And so stay tuned and blessings to you on your journey with Christ.